I'm interviewing Jim Tharp about his uh, uh, family quilts that have been in his family, I believe, for 150 years at this point. Family slave quilts. Family slave quilts. Um, the Hartsfield family quilt collection, which has been in his family for 150 years. Um, Jim, I will let you, I guess, so more so introduce yourself. I appreciate that. Uh, my name is Jim Tharp. I'm from Chicago, Illinois. My parents, Raymond Tharp and Verna Hartsfield Tharp, uh, were my parents. We traveled to Tennessee all of my during my youth. Um, I went to college at Lincoln University in Missouri. Um, nothing I can say now that can beat what my grandmother, great great grandmother, has done for my family. Having you interview me about her work in the uh, 18th century, 19th, yeah. yeah. So, um, how did you? How did the quilts come to you, or come by you? My mother, the last of her generation, she had five sisters, and um, the quilts had come from her, from my great grandmother to my mother's, from my mother, my grandmother, pardon me, to my mother ultimately, and then my mother then gave them to me. So it was passed down through um, several generations until I ended up with them roughly in 1990, starting in 1990, yes. Okay. Um, how did the, how did you end up taking the quilts and getting them appraised? How did that First of all, I had no clue of what I had. When you say, when we talked about quilts, when they were delivered to me by my mother, she never mentioned the age of the quilts. The quilts look virtually new. So because of their appearance, I just assumed that they at best could be 30, 40, 50 years old just so happened that there was a lady named Dr. Laurie, who's, a, who's an appraiser, came to town, world-renowned appraiser. And my wife said, we should go and just take a quilt and see, you know, what does she think about them? So when I went in to the median medium, she was there going through different people's items and saying they're worth this, they're worth that. And many were disappointed because the numbers they thought they should have were not there. Dr. Lori walked over to my place, my seating, looked at the quilt and said, do you understand what you have? And at that point, she started to express all the different things that I had in terms of the quilts and how old they were and all the other things that one might think about when it comes to slave quilts. From that point forward, um, I asked her all kinds of information about it and where I should go. And she gave me an appraisal and we started from there. So, so as your mother handed you these quilts, you literally had no idea what you had at all. Not at all. Not at all. They, you know, there was something my mother gave me and I remembered many things about quilting because of my relationship with my grandmothers. It just, it was just another normal thing. Okay, this is something you need to keep for the family. All right, mom, I'll do it. And that was it. I had no clue that they were all from my great, great, my majority was from my great, great, great grandmother in 1854. Uh, you have, you said, if I remember correctly, you have 13 quilts, correct? I have 13 quilts. One quilt, um, I'd left out of the appraisal because as a friend of mine said, she walked, who was a centrist, 
she walked into my house and we were looking at the other quilts and she said, what about that one over there where the cat is sitting on? And uh, I said, uh, I discount that one. I'm not talking about it at all. And come to find out it was another one that was, it's 70 years old and very nice looking. And now I'm using it as my 13th. But the other 12 were um, appraised and you know, those are the slave quotes. Okay. Um, you used to, if I remember reading correctly, you used to go out and choose uh, scrap scraps of rags for your uh, your grandmother to make these quilts. Am I correct? Yes, you are. Um, so you were even helping to to in a way you were helping to make these quilts and you still at that point didn't know what you were contributing to yeah i mean we're talking about when i was very young number one mm -hmm. number two i understood the social um reasoning why my grandmother wanted to continue to sew besides loving it but it also allowed her to have sewing bees at my house with other ladies shall we say or grandmothers who came from the south and went to the north to live with their children and they basically did child care for the family. My grandmother was just like that. And I had the opportunity of working with her on particular quilts. Now you talk about the scrap quilt and the material used. I lived in, again, I lived in Chicago and the alleyway were commerce. That's where you had your ice, you bought your ice you found uh, people would come down the alleys and uh, sharpen your, your knives. In addition to the man, you know, who wanted scraps, we called him the scrap man. And he would ride through the alley and saying, scraps, scraps for sale, scraps. And all the kids would run out to see him because number one, he had a horse and it was a wagon and it was just, just grateful. We were all grateful to be involved with something different than what we were normally, you know, tasked to. But at that point, when Rag Man took the took all the material to the rag company, which was no more than 75, 80 yards away from where I lived, then at that point, what the rag company would separate the rags as the ones they wanted versus the ones they didn't. And they would put them all in this this bundle. And this bundle to me as a kid, remember I'm five, six years old, and it looked like it was, you know, a mountain to me at the time. And I would crawl through these, these, uh, uh, not quotes, but materials that were not being used by the company. And they allowed the kids, because I would be one of many, searching through to find out which color or fabric type we could take back to our parents or our grandparents in my case. So that's how it was found. That's how I got involved. That's how I understood the colors and, and everything else because my grandmother kept me in tune as to, this is what I want, feel this material, you know, okay. So it was the beginning, but I still didn't have a clue about 1854. <laughs> my grandmother's <laughs> life began. Now, your family lineage goes back to Paris, uh, Paris, Whitlock, Tennessee, correct? Correct. Um, how important is it to the story? Uh, how important is it to the story to be told? I guess, how important is it to know about that lineage of Paris, Whitlock, Tennessee? Um. <laughs> I'd laugh because without having that understanding of my people and what has happened to them over the years, um, it would be impossible for you to think about those quilts and not think about the people and the injustices that they went through just to save the quilts. Um, the town Whitlock, for example, and if you were to look that up in 
you would say Whitlock is 135 miles from Memphis and 135 miles from Nashville. And that would be it. That describes the town. So when I look at that, you would, as I'm doing now, I'm laughing about it because it doesn't make sense. But on the other side of that same coin, within that coin, that flip side of that coin, you see a family or families who lived on the same plantation or the same house where the plantation was located. You will find people who have never thought about moving to the city for many different reasons. You will find people who move back to that area for many different reasons. And for those reasons, typically they're, they would be foreign to people like you and I, people who are in other cities, moved to other cities, did other kinds of things. But understanding those people and understanding that many of the items that we take for granted during that time, that period of time, when you're talking about electricity, when you're talking about telephone, those things weren't available. And we're, we're talking about 1950s. They just were not available in the backwoods of Tennessee. So how important is it? I think it's very important. I think it's very important to understand that the Klan was less than, was created less than 100 miles from these quilts. That the people who, lit, who made these quilts had to endure the Klan. Then the other side of that coin, we look at they endured the Klan, but they also were in a position to work with each other to escape because this is the worst place to be in. So I think it's extremely important. What are your, uh, what are your earliest recollections of going back home to Tennessee? Um, quite honestly, I remember going back prior to uh, the story I wrote uh, about the people in Tennessee. I, I, four or five in that area, three, somewhere in that area. Um, it wasn't the first time that I was in Tennessee that, you know, I, I noticed all these things. I guess I was a year younger, but um, it would have to be around five or six. Um, and you went back for a funeral. That particular time I went back for a family funeral. What was that experience like? Cause you even learned a little bit more about the, the history of your family and the history of some of these quilts back then. Yeah. Um, you know, <clears throat> What was the question again to be sure? Um, no, I was just asking um, when you went back, uh, uh, when you went back as a kid for the funeral, um, you learned a lot more. You, you learned about the history um, of, of your family and the history of the quilts. Correct. Um, I had, um, in, in my life, my, I had one grandfather that was uh, an entrepreneur, and I had a, another grandfather who worked in the fields. Um, so many of the time, most of the time I was spending with my grandfather who um, was an entrepreneur. And we spent a lot of time in the fields. We spent a lot of time um, looking at cattle, those kinds of things. What happened, what happened was, uh, God, I missed your point again. I am so sorry. No, 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 that's fine. That's fine. Just, uh, we're just talking about the history, not only of your family, but the history of the quilts. What happened was, is that for the funeral, I was staying at my father's father's house and my grandfather on my father's side which was not far from this particular funeral. And we had, I had, not we, but I had the opportunity as a small child to go back into 
what I would have called at that point history by seeing people live the way they lived in the 1800s. To go to a funeral that took place the same way it would have taken place in the 1800s, uh, where you would have the body in the household, you would have people coming from the community coming to a house for a social event. Now, true enough, it was for a funeral, but it was a social event for the people who lived in the area because it gave them the opportunity to meet each other. And for that reason, it was, it was extremely important to see the love that the people who would, I thought, and quite honestly at the time, I put my nose down on. I did not believe that they lived that kind of way, looked that kind of way, dressed in the same type of clothes that they could have dressed in in the 20s or in the 1800s. Um, it was very difficult for me there. But meeting the people, understanding their goals, watching them love each other was more than I could have expected. And I really enjoyed it. Which um, crazy, but I did. What was one of the most important lessons you would say you learned going back to Tennessee? Never judge the book by its cover. And I say that because uh, we we're talking about the funeral and how the funeral affected me. It was the first time I had a chance to see a dead body, a relative. But it was also the first time I really had an opportunity to look at something that was extremely beautiful, which was called a quilt compared to how people lived in that situation. That a person who had nothing could create something that would gratify their personality to the others. That was the difference. When I, my, my father lifted me, I'll never forget this. There's, imagine a body's laying on the table, coffin, wooden box. I'm, four or five years old, we're going up to it. My father picks me up. He allows me to look at the body. I'm thinking, you know, this body's not moving. What, I mean, you know, what is it? Because at, at that age, I didn't know what death was. So he, t he gives me a little lesson. He, he puts me down on the floor. And just as he does that, I can look into this bedroom with quilts, with a quilt, pardon me. As a young kid, I walked into the bedroom and it was just stunning. It was just this quilt laid on this bed with candle lights on both sides. And all I could see is this beautiful piece of artwork. Now, contrary to when I walked out that room, I saw a lot of old quilts on the sofa chairs, that type of thing. I didn't see any pictures, but basically the most beautiful thing in that house was that quilt. And I repeatedly went back to it several times to look at it because that was the most pleasant thing that was there. That's it on that. You guys, uh, you and your family, when you, you left Chicago and traveled by caravan, to, uh, uh, to Tennessee for this particular funeral, correct? Correct. Um, why did you have to travel by caravan? Um, I'm not sure if it's the time of Emmett Till or not, but regardless of that fact, um, it was, it was very typical for, for black families to travel in groups because if you were caught singly in a single car, it would be possible that you could be killed very easily. So we traveled, you know, four or five cars in a row. We did, we tried to drive as fast as we could to get to, from Tennessee, I mean, Chicago to Tennessee. We had to be aware of absolutely everything. Um, 
including where we had got our gas, where we could stop. So it was fear of our lives that we traveled in a caravan. Mm. That's why. Is that when you really began to understand uh, the difference of how Blacks are treated in the North versus the South? Yeah, I mean, once I would get to Tennessee, for example, the obvious would hit me, you know. Um, one, we couldn't go into certain bathrooms. Two, you sat at the back of the bus. <laughs> Three, um, which I really enjoy, when you went to the movie house, you sat in the balcony. Now in Chicago, the balcony was a big deal. Hmm. But in Tennessee, that was just for Black folks, the balcony. And those kinds of things start to wear off on you as to what you can and cannot do. And who will say what to you if you don't do it? So those are the, those are the situations that occurred to me at that age that I knew something was wrong. Let me give you one other example. While we were in Tennessee, we were taking another trip within the backwoods, shall we say, or even to the city. Mm -hmm. And we were on this road and we needed gas and my father pulls off to, in the gas, to the gas station. This fellow walks out and says, you know, what do you need? And my father tells him and I, I, raised, I raised my hand, but I said, basically, can I get some water? Where do I get water? And the guy looks at a hose and he says, follow my hose, follow that hose and you can get some water. Now the hose took you down to a little screen where in Tennessee, you have water moccasins, everything around water. And my mother was walking with me and I said, I, I don't understand. Why are we going down here to get water? And basically that was the first step. Well, mm -hmm. one of the first steps where I learned that black folks were not qualified in any way to drink water were white folks. Were. And that mm -hmm. was my background. Um, you, I mean, relatively speaking, for, especially for history of African American, you were able to uncover a certain amount of history about your, your great grandmother your great great grandmother, Miss Molly. Mm -hmm. um, I found that a bit fascinating because we know the history of, of of Black Americans. We know that simply you could walk off and change your last name, and that would change your entire lineage. Um, most of us didn't have birth certificates or death certificates or marriage certificates. So I found it very fascinating that you were able to uncover so much history about your great great grandmother miss molly how did you how how were you able to come by so much information regarding her well there were two reasons um one is the fact that my grandmother knew her she was nine my grandmother knew her uh remembered her and she died my great grandmother died when she was nine so I have my Miss Molly, my great great grandmother, and my grandmother knew each other when my grandmother was a child. My grandmother gave me some hints of what was happening as a child with her grandmother. She would make comparisons. From there, learning about the other parts of the family because my mother knew her great uncles which also were born in slavery and were free people at that point so there are a couple of areas where i could pick up information over the years even the word molly which my mother was she said, I'm sure her name is Molly, you know, because like you said, people change names and they do things all the time. Um, and it was one of those subjects about slavery. They really didn't want to get into that much, quite honestly. But my mother did remember Molly. And from there, I just kept asking questions. 
Okay. Um, what would you say is the significance of these quilts, of, of, of the Hartsfield quilt collection? Interesting point. From my perspective, okay? Strictly my perspective. I'm probably going to go against what many scholars are saying. But I had my great great grandmother, Miss Molly, made sure that there are certain quilts that were saved. I have to assume that because I'm sure she made many, many other quilts, but the selection she saved for her children all related to issues relating to the Underground Railroad. If you look at her first quilt, the quilt that she had on her bed, um, it basically is called the crossroads. I have to do something. This is what the, basically it reads. Uh, I have to do something to leave this life, to do di something differently. I'm at my crossroads. I am tired. Then you go to the next one where it talks about the slave who is trying to escape. And it's a message saying that you have to be prepared to change clothes in this town. Or another message that the master or the white people in this particular area will help you. Now, there's, there's three or four of them there. And in the book, I outlined them. And for myself, I truly believe that my grandmother tried to send me a message and my relatives a message through the work she has done. Not so much about who she is, that kind of thing. Um, I worked on this point, but rather I worked making quilts that signify these things, that it could be taken over or used so that people trying to escape will have a way to do it. That's why I think it's here. Other than that, why would she save these quilts? Why would she identify these quilts? Or even today, we as people can identify those quilts, coatings based on the African-American coats. So for that reason, they're very important. Would you say that these uh, these quilts um, also play a role in 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 telling the story, even though it's of one family or the the lineage of one family? Would you say that these quilts play the role in giving us some historical accurate? Or I'm trying. How am I trying to word this correctly? Do you think they serve? any way, shape, or form in Black history, teaching us about Black history? The last words I didn't hear. Uh, do you feel, basically, do you, uh, what role do you think the slave, slave quilts play in Black history and overall American history? Um, obviously, the quilt, just being in itself a quilt, was a very good thing. Um, Everybody needs to stay warm. Getting past that, you want to talk about art. And you might call it folk art. You may call it modern art for that period of time. Um, but the fact that Blacks created that, the Black women had the insight of being able to make patterns from the Europeans and then create something for themselves. For example, I have one quilt, stunning, but then it has a green piece right on the left-hand side of it. And it's a beautiful piece of work, but I looked at it originally and said, why is this green piece here? And then I was at one of the sh showing the quilt someplace and a, a doctor walked up to me and said, do you understand what the green means? And I go, no, that means your family came through Louisiana. Oh, okay. The green. So I look at the quilts as being something that was usable by us, by Black people, 
to pass messages. Okay. Um, speaking of that, you have twice referred to the fact that many of those quilts had uh, messages embedded in them. Um, can you expound further on those type of messages that you found in the quilt, if you found in the quilts? Um, the patterns are the issues. If you look at slave quilts, I don't have the sheet in front of me, but if you look at slave quilt patterns, and there's many books on them, you will be able to see all of those, not all, but many of those quilt patterns within my quilt. And um, in my book, I outline, I show exactly, you know, where they can come from and that kind of thing. So um, the importance of the quilt to the black community, it was extremely important, not just for shall we say the codes, but they were also important for their artwork and family ingenuity or individual ingenuity and making something so beautiful. So. Um, can you also uh, expound upon, I mean, we know these quilts are beautiful and they have geometric shapes that many people can't explain how uh, uh, slaves who were supposed to be illiterate and not able to read, much less come up with these. Uh, G, G, um, uh, what was I'm trying? I'm trying to the, the type of shapes, but also these blacks women specifically endured a hardship um, that set them apart from most, and then were still able to create these quilts. I hope I'm explaining that right. Yeah, um, let's deal with the women first, okay? Mm -hmm. And then we get to the quilts. Black women had, a, in, during the slavery period, um, a difficult time for, on many, many, many fronts, along with the black man, do you understand? Um, the black woman had to endure the white male for many reasons besides just wanting to be happy for a white male that want pleasure with a black woman. Keep in mind, women were, black women were in the South raised to create new life for the plantation owner. He needed as many bodies out there, slave bodies, as he possibly could. So it's his duty, his responsibility to the, to the plantation to ensure that he had more bodies as slaves. Now, keeping that in mind, that meant that families or if you live, if, if a man lived with a woman, which was possible, and the white man walked in and said, I want your woman, that would be it. So it affected not only the black man or the black woman who had to endure it, but it shattered the black man's ego and his family. It decimated the community's attitude um, towards the slave master, but everyone understood they all might be chosen the next day to do exactly the same thing. So the woman had a great deal to deal with emotionally. The ma black male also had that by not being able to control his own in any area and um, did need be killed if he responded in any way that was negative towards the slave master. So when you talk about the woman's um,
challenges, that would definitely be one. When you look at, or when I look at asking my mother, so eh, I must have been at this point, eight, nine years old. And I asked my mother, what was the worst thing in slavery? What do you think slavery was about? I mean, was it the work? And the first thing out of her mouth was, no, it was the rape. That's yeah. what she remembers. Now, keep in mind, Civil War was over in, in 1866. Yeah. And blacks in the South basically still lived, shall we say, in Tennessee, still lived under the plantation system. I was asking my grand, my uncle, who's 95 years old, he's, and I said, can you tell me the first time, and I was just asking a question, the first time you had an indoor bathroom, and the first thing that came out of his mouth was, son, when I was 13 years old, this is 1920s, okay, 1922 to three, somewhere in that area. Mr. Charlie came to our house, and I call him Mr. Charlie because he no longer is a slave master. He's the son of the slave master. So Mr. Charlie told my uncle, how old, ask him, how old are you? My uncle says, I'm 13. He says, why are you still playing in this yard at 13? So my uncle said, you know, what else can I do? I'm enjoying myself, basically. And the master told him, you got two choices. In the morning, be in the fields, or two, become a carpenter working for me. Your choice. And he became the car carpenter. Now, he also went on to tell me that things really didn't change until 19, roughly 1930, 1929, when the Great Crash occurred, where white folks were selling property, tr trying to do what they could do to survive. That was the time that a lot of Black folks left, joined the service, did anything because there was nothing available for them. So when I look at that picture, I look at my mother, I look at her mother, and I think about the women who went through those challenges. And then I think about the men who went through those challenges. And then I go to, this didn't end to 29. The war had been all, you know, the war was over years ago. It didn't make a difference. Kind of similar to what's happening today. Mm. Um, how, how important was it to, for you to make sure that this story got told? Uh, extremely important, extremely important. Um, one of the things that bothers me a lot these days is the fact that so many people uh, in the city where I live say that they're you know, they're half this, half that. And it's a wonderful thing that people can say that, you know, I'm half this and everybody accepts it. Um, but coming up in Chicago, living half the time in Tennessee, there became something far more worthy of understanding, understanding our ancestors. I went to Lincoln University, a black college, where I was able to perform at my highest level. And because of that, I realized that everybody didn't have that opportunity. And having the ability or having been taught by some great teachers about black history, slavery. It gave me the emphasis to do something to show my people that we're different than most. We have been created by these, by white people over these years that 
we are a hybrid that has done something in America. Um, and I want to show it. And that's what happened. Here's something important I was reading. When I was reading um, your essay, one thing that stood out to me was the argument that seems to pop up when you talk about these quilts and the messages embedded in these quilts, um, how some people discount that slaves were even able to have came up with such elaborate, ge uh, uh, I want to keep wanting to say geographic, but not geographic, like, but, 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 but ge geometrical or ge I hope I'm saying it right. <laughs> um, these, these types of patterns to relay messages and they say, well, if slaves couldn't read, then how were they relaying these messages? And they try to discount that uh, uh, these early Black Americans were were even able to do this. What what would you say to that? Huh. First of all, um, everyone in the world does not communicate by writing. That's number one. Number two, people who say that, and I've met several people who say that really don't believe that Blacks had the intelligence to do something. So we're talking about someone, people who, who say those kinds of things really just don't believe we're intelligent enough to come up with a way to communicate. Even though Blacks when they, as slaves, very few Blacks from the same, shall we say, area of Africa were in the same house because they had to speak a different language. They did not want slaves to come up and kill the masters by having the same language and doing it. So from that perspective, if all I can do is say to those people, we accomplish a lot because doing slavery by leaving the South. And the only way we could leave the South would be based on some kind of messaging service or system that would say how to get away from a situation from slavery. And if you did not have some that type of communication, then what would you have? That's the bottom line. Hmm. Um, there's one other question. Oh yeah, more lighthearted question. Okay. Which one is your favorite quilt? My favorite quilt was made in 18, uh, roughly 1850. It was the very first one. And I'll tell you why it's my favorite quilt. The design of the quilt is fabulous. If you turn it over and look at the way how she sewed, um, it's extremely unique, extremely unique. So because of this uniqueness, I typically tell the audience, or I ask the audience, you know, what do you see in this quilt? And people tell me about the design. They tell me about the, uh, uh, the, the colors. They have a hundred thousand things to say about the quilt itself. And then I ask, they, they will ask me rather, I say, well, what's, what do you think? And I go, you see the blood? See the blood on the top? See the blood on the bottom? I think about my grandmother getting great. You see this beautiful piece. I see her as being raped. I don't know if they, she was beaten for this blood to be set like this. I don't have a clue, but I do know it's her blood. And she saved it for her family to look at. That's why it's important. Then there's one other quote, and I will say this one. Uh, added on. This is my saving, second favorite quilt. It's the quilt she made once slavery was over, the war was over, and it's the pineapple quilt that basically means hope. That is the only quilt that she did not put a backing on. She just made the patches, put them together, the, the blocks rather, put them together and saved them. Now, when I look at her first quilt that says, I'm at the crossroad, I got to do something. 
to see her second quilt that she saved that says, I'm not sure about this hope thing. I'm, 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 I believe I'm free. I think that I have an opportunity to better myself, but I'm not sure yet. And that's the one that's not completed. So why she saved that quilt that's not completed, but yet all the other quilts were and are immaculate. Why? And the only thing I can think of, she wanted me to see or her family to understand what she endured while in slavery. The other quilts don't have that at all. Have nothing to do with blood, with with a prior life. They've been set in a area, kept there at Cedar Chest for for 70 years. And um, so you don't see the life in the quilt as you would with my grandmother's quilt, original quilt. I got one last question for you, sir. Um, what is it that you want your audience, what's the most important thing you want your audience to walk away knowing about not only the Hearts, the Hartsfield family quilts, but about their contributions what is it that contributions or anything else you want to add for that matter what what is it that you want people to walk away knowing or understanding well the contributions would have to go back to where we are now trying to find out about the codes and how they place them in the quilts um the quilts themselves or the represent the ingenuity that black folks had during a period of time when they had absolutely nothing. I talked about going, in my book, I talked about going to this funeral, um, which was based on how jewelry a place could be, but yet offer you beautiful things like quilts. And I wanted people to know what those quilts represented and the people who made them. When I was visited, when I was, pardon me, when I was uh, at that funeral, I couldn't help but think about how could somebody sew with just candlelights? It's not during the day because during the day they had to do their work. So all you had was candlelight. Then you had to design a pattern. Mm -hmm. Then you had to make these blocks in candlelight conditions. Then you had to have the ability to understand mathematics so you could put the blocks together. Now, many whites don't understand that because they don't understand the process. But once you understand the process of making a quilt and all the parts that go into making that quilt, and then you think about, we're talking about people who are supposed to be dumb, stupid, but yet they have the ability to use mathematics as a slave to create a quilt. That's different. That's very different. And that's a message that should be passed on, not just for that generation, but for future generations. And those quilts can do that. So would you consider, I guess I'd say, so you consider, um, you consider the quilts a bit of a historical artifact? Yes. Okay. I can accept that. <laughs> um, what else or are there any final thoughts that you have we've covered a wide range of things in a short period of time um, is there anything you would like to add to this let us not forget the struggles of Blacks in the South in the past and in the future. Today, we just got a situation where 
we have the first black uh, senator. Where is it? Um, not Mississippi, but Georgia. Georgia, pardon me. And when you think about how many people live in Georgia, and this is the first time we have a black in that position, things are changing, but they're changing at a very slow pace. Hmm. And for whites who are looking at blacks saying, you know, you want too much. Hmm. Let's slow this down. We will give it to you at some point. I want these quotes to remind the, that group of people that we started with this years and years ago. But for whatever reason, we can't get a helping hand. Hmm. I guess you would have to go to Willie Lynch and his papers as describing how whites feel about blacks and how they should control them for a thousand thousand years. Hmm. You bring up an interesting point. Uh, to some degree, the, 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 these quotes tie in exactly to what we're seeing now, exactly. except, except now it seems like it's been sped up for some odd reason. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the quilts represent the slow, the slow growth, or I don't even know if you want to call it growth, just the slowness of, of people being able to even find any type of equality or get a helping hand. Would you agree with that? Oh man, yes, totally. I, I, I remember going to I remember going to Lookout Mountain, I believe, where they had the Confederate soldiers, um, statue, not statues, but um, faces on the wall with their horses, come to think about it. And as a child, my parents wanted to take me there. And I was telling you the story about the water, where mm -hmm. I had to go out to the stream and get water next to, with the snakes and everything. Well, we finally get to our destination. And I, again, I must have been four or five years old. And I was thinking, Chicago, get, I can go anywhere. Um, but when I, we were looking, we were on top of the mountain, and there was a washroom, and I went into it. And I guess, you know, all hell broke out. Um, people came out of a man came out of the bathroom telling me, can you control your child? That kind of thing. That, that was a very scary situation for me, but it definitely underlined the tone of white folks will do dangerous things to you. So as a child, I had to deal with how do I relate to white people at a very early age. So the quilts bring out all those things. The meaning of those quilts really emphasizes what black folks had to go through. I guess that was, those are my final questions, Mr. Tharp. Um, I appreciate you uh, allowing me to interview and find out a little history on uh, the Hartsfield, Hartsfield family quilts.